first time for today. And actually, I have just been informed that it is very timely since Mr. and Mrs. Nemso will be celebrating their 72nd birthday. Wow. 71st wedding anniversary tomorrow. What a great way to celebrate uh, their love. To kind of do this on a monthly basis, uh, just little things that you may not think of that would make a huge difference as we look into living a more sustainable life. No one thinks about this at a gathering as having an impact on the planet. And so that's why we wanted to do a brief presentation, some tastings, whether we do food or drink, just to plant the seed that there are ways that we can change that be helpful in preserving our home. So without further ado, let me know at the end of the program if you think you enjoyed it. That's the goal, is not to give you information for the sake of information, but to also make it fun, make it entertaining, make you have a good time. Come together and share as a community in a way that is beneficial to the planet. So, it, I am going to introduce Rumia, who is uh, representing the Biscayne Community Foundation, and she is our bartender for today, and she is uh, very knowledgeable. So pay attention, she has a lot to share with us. All right, thanks Roxy. Hi everybody, it's really nice to be here with you guys today. Um, as Roxy said, my name is Ramya. I am the Citizen Science Coordinator for the Key Biscayne uh, Community Foundation. Um, I'm the Program Manager for their Citizen Science uh, Project. Um, a little bit about me, I'm also a third year PhD student um, at the Rosensteel School on Virginia Key. Um, I'm a biologist by training and uh, more specifically a marine biologist. Um, but a lot of what I, I do, both for my own research and uh, research that I've collaborated on and worked on in the past, um, has to do you know, with a wide ranging um, areas in, in the science world. So climate change, pollution, um, a lot of things. <laughs> um, no need to list everything. Um, so today, as, uh, as Roxy mentioned, I'm going to talk to you about um, green drinks and specifically the sustainability of um, alcohol production. When we think about um, environmental problems in general, it's very easy to sort of overlook things like this and, and focus on the bigger things you know, that, are, that are very much in your face, like plastic pollution is obviously a huge one. Um, you know, airline travel and, and just travel in general, which you know, increases your carbon footprint and the, the amount of carbon dioxide that gets into the air. You know, there are a lot of like huge industries that, that we all know are responsible for an enormous amount of the sort of environmental problems that we face. Um, but even knowing that, it doesn't mean that we should overlook the smaller things that are a little bit more close to home. Um, and it doesn't mean that we can't you know, continue to work in our own capacity to, to make a difference. Um, so when we think about alcohol and the environment, um, as I mentioned, it's not something that's usually talked about very much in like an environmental sense. Um, but there are a lot of uh, different aspects to um, alcohol production, and that could be wineries, um, liquor dis distilleries, um, beer breweries, um, you know, just all the different types of, of alcohol that there are have these different methods for being produced and produce a lot of different uh, waste products and, you know, use a lot of... Um, plastic packaging and, and uh, not environmentally sound fuels, things like that. So starting with wineries, um, the, the big, the obvious one, you know, if any of you have seen a winery, obviously they take huge amounts of land for the, the growing grapes. And you have to spray all of those grapes with fungicides and pesticides and fertilizers to make sure that, you know, you're not having crop damage from, from bugs and, and uh, fungus and things like that. Um, fertilizer, obviously, to help them grow. And while that's, you know, obviously useful for the winery, those things get into the environment and can cause, you know, really serious problems. Um, some of you may know that just recently in Florida, they passed um, a law that kind of uh, limits when and how much fertilizer you can use on your lawn. And that's because we have had huge problems with fertilizer getting into the um, aquatic ecosystems and basically feeding algae. So we get these huge algae blooms 
um, part of w one of which was partly responsible for the huge fish kill that we had a couple years ago. So um, it, it, it's sort of a, a cascading effect where you get extra nutrients from fertilizer and things into the water. It creates a huge bloom of algae. Um, the algae will blot out the sun, so things like seagrass and other plants that need the sun to grow, they die off. And then eventually the food runs out for the algae, so the algae dies. And then there are these microorganisms that eat up the algae, and in doing so, to help it decompose. But in doing so, they use up all of the oxygen in the water. And then that's what ultimately causes a fish kill, because there's no oxygen for the fish to breathe. So, um, so that's just an example of why fertilizers can be such a huge problem. Um, but obviously, pesticides and, and herbicides, things like that, can have environmental issues as well. Um, water usage, especially if you look at places like Napa Valley, uh, other places in California, huge water shortages. You know, they have the wildfires, it's really dry. Um, they're having a really bad problem with drought. And, but then for a winery, you need huge amounts of water to water the plants there. And so, and this is true, again, with most agriculture, this, you know, is, can be a more or less of a problem, but that is something to consider. Um, but they also, you know, they use uh, w water for other things. Um, so there's like hosing down barrels, um, washing out tanks, cleaning their buildings, because obviously because the wine is for consumption, all of these things have to be kept very clean. And that also, these, the cleaning process takes quite a bit of water as well. Um, <clears throat> they use a lot of non-biodegradable materials, um, both in the actual um, fermenting process, but also in the packaging. Um, and one thing that people don't realize is that while we all throw our glass bottles into the recycling, hopefully we all do that, um, colored glass is not optimal for recycling. And a lot of glass recyclers will reject colored glass. And show me a wine bottle that's not in a colored glass, or that isn't colored glass. You don't get wine in a clear bottle. That just almost never happens. Beer maybe, but not wine. And so recycling wine bottles can actually um, be very, very difficult. Um, and there was a study done, I think two years ago, that showed that um, w colored wine bottles are responsible for up to 600,000 tons of waste per year. Mm. It doesn't get recycled, it ends up in landfills because they won't recycle it. Um, as I mentioned, yeah, it's it, well, because again, this the alcohol production isn't something that comes up much when you're talking about environmental problems. On the, the like large scale of things, it is a smaller percentage of carbon emissions overall. You know, when you're looking at, at other large industries, you know, plastic and airlines and things like that. But it is a large enough percentage that it should be considered. Really everything, as much as, as possible, we should kind of take into account in our everyday lives. And if everybody does that, it will make actually a, a huge difference. Um, so environmentally harmful fuels, um, that's just kind of, that comes with almost any industry, in particular when you're talking about transportation. Um, you know, wines have to be shipped everywhere, all over the world, and so that involves planes and trucks and all kinds of things, and so you end up with carbon, carbon emissions that way. Um, but then you also get carbon from the fermentation process, um, the engines that are used in, in various like um, manufacturing processes, um, the other machinery, and then of course the distribution, as I mentioned, um, the transportation accounts for most of it. Um, but all of these things up here are very integral in the whole uh, cultivation of, of um, wineries and the packaging and the transportation. So you can't have wine without all of these things. And don't get, and, and we'll get into this a little bit later. There are wineries that are more sustainable than others, and that is something that you, is easily researched. But for the, in, in the general sense, this, these are sort of the problems with wineries. Um, and then there are also, you know, concerns that, and again, this isn't specifically environmental, but like you want to take into account the pickers that they hire to, you know, pick the grapes and do a lot of the work, like the, 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 um, the hands that they hire to do this. A lot of times those can be um, illegal aliens. A lot of times they're not, you know, and again, this kind of depends on the winery and where it is and how it's being done. Um, you know, financially, physically, and socially, they may not be, you know, in the best situation. But again, that's not necessarily an environmental issue, just something to kind of keep in mind. Um, and I did mention, as far as water goes, there are other agricultural businesses that use far more water than wineries do, but it is, you know, a contributor. I will not, never stop drinking wine. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes. There's always research being done, um, but as far as what's commercially available, there aren't really 
a lot of safe fertilizers or fertilizers that are not sort of environmentally harmful. And a lot of that has to do with um, you know, what's in the fertilizer itself, but also the way it's used. So it may not be that the fertilizer is harmful, but people will use too much of it. And then the excess gets washed into other ecosystems. And, um, you know, and, and sometimes like you, you just, especially on farms. So I grew up in Indiana. I worked as an agronomist for a little while. Um, and one of the, the issues that we would have with farmers where they would just over fertilize because they were concerned about under fertilizing. You know, so they're like, well, I have to make sure that my crops are getting enough nutrients because if I don't get the, the crop at the end of the season that I need, then I'm going to lose a ton of money. Completely legitimate concern. But in the process of having that worry, sometimes they would over fertilize, which has its own detrimental effects that will affect their crop output at the end also. But the other consequence is that there's too much fertilizer that gets into other systems. And, um, and so it's not necessarily that the fertilizer itself is the problem, but the amount that's used and how it's used and how it's distributed. So organic fertilizer is it, it's this it's more or less the same stuff. Um, yeah. Because it's you know, the things that you need for plants to grow. That's really all it is. And algae inherently is a plant. It it lives by um, photosynthesis and it's green. You know, it work, it's essentially just like a plant. And so when you have those same things that you're putting in your grass to make it grow and it gets into an aquatic system, it's gonna make the algae grow. And you know, so that's it, regardless of the type of fertilizer you're using, it's going to have that same effect. So looking at liquor production, um, a lot of the same problems, um, but liquor is made from obviously not from grapes. Um, it's depending on the liquor you're using, there are different ways of making it. Vodka is made from potatoes. Um, there are some liquors that are made from rice and you know things like that. So it's a, it's a different method of production, different agricultural business. But what you find is that sometimes you have things like rice and potatoes being made for alcohol production and not then used for things like the global food shortage. <laughs> you know, people don't get rice and potatoes, which is like, you know, staples in some places because that's now being used to make alcohol rather than feed people. Um, so that's one, uh, not again, not specifically environmental, but definitely sort of a, can be a global issue. Um, but um, liquor production specifically come, uh, creates uh, specific types of toxic waste. And um, for instance, and I, and I didn't want to list out everything because of every kind of liquor, you know, there's different things that they come up with. But the example I have here is tequila. For every one liter of tequila, you get five kilos of pulp and 11 liters of acidic waste, so basically acid. Um, and like that's what's produced. And a lot of that just ends up in landfills. Um, in, um, so in Mexico, where tequila is produced, that can, can, uh, has been known, it's been found to contaminate surrounding areas of the soil and the water because it leaches out of landfills or it's not properly disposed of from the actual distillery. And so, you know, and, and just think about that, one liter, just one bottle of tequila um, has that much waste that goes along with it. Um, so packaging and refrigeration for transport, um, huge use of energy and of course the carbon footprint from transportation. Um, and then again, waste from packaging. You have like, you know, the padding, the plastic, the cardboard, the glass, everything that goes with that. Um, rum is especially toxic to the environment. Um, it's made from molasses and cane juice. And those, uh, the byproducts of that um, can very easily disrupt microorganism balances um, in the soil and the surrounding aquatic environments. Um, the, the byproducts from that are specifically known to be uh, toxic if they're not properly disposed of. Um, and then, you, when, again, when we're looking at transportation, there are certain things that, that happen with liquor that you don't necessarily see with wine, because there are several places around the world that produce wine. You know, you have wine in California, wine in France, wine in Italy. Um, I think there's even wineries in Australia. Um, yes, excellent. Yeah, so, right, so, you know, so you have, like, places that produce wine all over the world. Um, some liquors can be produced everywhere, but then you have things like tequila. It's only produced in Mexico. Nowhere else in the world produces tequila. Same with Scotch whiskey is only produced in Ireland. You can't produce it anywhere else. It's not produced anywhere else. But both of those liquors are widely available globally. So you can imagine how much, their, how much the carbon footprint is for those two liquors in particular because they have to be transported all over the world in very large quantities. 
So you have the, the large amounts that are being produced and the, amount of, like, the large amount of waste from that, and then the, the uh, extremely large distribution like nets that you know, travel all over the world from one location. And so what you have essentially is just a very fairly large environmental problem. <coughs> um, beer is actually the least offensive <laughs> as far as the environment goes. Um, by volume of consumption, beer uh, produces fewer emissions than both wine and liquor. Um, so beer is responsible for, I believe it's 80% of alcohol consumption, something around that number. Um, but of that, they are only res beer is only responsible for about 62% of emissions. So um, while wine and liquor have a much smaller percentage of consumption, for that volume, they produce way more emissions. Um, but that doesn't mean that you know, it's not worth taking into account. Um, growing things like hops, malt, barley, that takes up agricultural land that then can't be used for food production. Um, again, you have uh, you know, fertilizers and pesticides and all kinds of things that have to be sprayed so that these can be um, used for uh, breweries. Um, and yeah, so I said that, so water, fertilizer, pesticide usage, the same as the others, basically. Um, the brewing process does use quite a bit of energy and natural gas, and it does produce a lot of uh, waste products that are usually um, you know, thrown in landfills. Um, beer ingredients, because they use um, more of these sort of wheat products, um, they tend to uh, be more sort of resource intensive, um, and because of that, they emit a little bit more carbon, but again, less than wine and, uh, and liquor. The reason it matters, though, is because beer is consumed way more. So, so because of that, their overall percentage is fairly large. And uh, so in 2008, the New Belgium Brewing Company commissioned an environmental analysis. And they found for, I think it was their uh, Fat Tire, was, is one of their beers. I love that beer. Um, <laughs> that refrigeration, because once it's, once it's brewed, you have to refrigerate it as it's being transported most of the time. Um, refrigeration accounted for a third of their overall emissions. And then um, glass production for the beer bottles was uh, 22%, so a little bit less than a third of their emissions. So that's what they found was their packaging, their glass, and then their transportation is, was almost entirely where their emissions were coming from. Um, it's the same issue except that uh, less glass involved because draft is, is transported in the, the huge barrels. The, and um, so there's, you know, but the, and the barrels can usually be reused. So that's actually, you know, a little bit better. Um, so then you're just looking at the other issues, like the actual production side of it, as opposed to the, um, the packaging side of it. Um, but there is still the transportation involved for that. And the water that's being used. Right, yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's the production side. So are there actually environmentally friendly companies that produce alcohol? Of course there are. And that's a, a very much a growing industry. As people become more environmentally conscious, more and more companies are like hopping on that bandwagon. And you know, for some of them, maybe it's just because they're like, oh, well, we can make more money this way because that's what people are looking for. Who cares if that's the reason? At least they're actually doing it, and that's actually good for the planet. So um, you know, you would hope that they're doing it for better reasons than that. Than that, but you know, big companies, who knows? Um, one thing that's important to keep in mind. Companies don't like to hide the fact that they are environmentally friendly. They want people to know because that is good PR for them. So it's not hard to find environmentally friendly companies. It's just a matter of looking. Um, and a quick Google search, very easy. You can find out, just look up a specific liquor if you're curious, is this liquor environmentally friendly? Do a Google search, look at their website. If they have environmentally safe practices, that will be on their website, right there for you to see because they want people to know. Um, Maker's Mark, this is just one example, but there are several. The liquors I chose today are all environmentally friendly. Um, but Maker's Mark is a good example, um, and they tend to be actually a little bit better than, than other ones. Um, as most of you know, they, they make whiskey, they're quite popular. Um, they buy local grain, and they turn the waste from their processing into energy. So they use that, um, I'm not sure if they burn it or if they, they do something with it, but they use it to create energy as opposed to just throwing it into a landfill. Um, they're strongly invested in looking after their water source. So they have two lakes on their property that they use for their water, um, for the, the, the whole production process. And um, one of them they, they keep kind of as like a backup kind of reservoir, and then they only use one of them. 
um, and that way they're not taking you know groundwater or municipal water or whatever to, to you know and using up that resource so they have their own water source that they you know keep very carefully and um, and they keep it clean so and so you know the whole point is to make sure that the quantities of water they're using are sustainable and then they own part of the land that they own where their distillery is um, is part of a nature preserve and they have teams that actually plant native plants there um, to attract bees and butterflies and birds and things like that and they um, have an entire environmental team dedicated to this so that team is in charge of the nature preserve that's on their property and then also keeping their their um, their lakes clean for the distilling process um, this is just uh, an example if you were to buy um, alcohol online wine.com um, if you look at where the red arrows are that little green leaf that means that that is a green liquor or a green wine or whatever it is you're looking at on that website they specifically will mark them to tell you that this one is environmentally friendly or at least that liquor is advertising itself as environmentally friendly so um, if you don't just want to believe the little leaf you can always google that liquor and see it, what they say about being environmentally friendly um, but a lot of places have started doing this to give you kind of a quicker guide um, while you're, you're browsing um, and then on the flip side Climate change is also affecting the way alcohol is being produced. Um, and I, I didn't want to get into this too much. Um, I'm sure some of you have been to my lectures, so you've <laughs> heard all about climate change and how terrible it is. Um, and we don't want to do that. We're going to get drunk and have fun. So, um, <laughs> But what climate change is doing um, in, in particular, what they found is that with wineries, um, in warmer climates, the grapes are producing more sugar. And then the sugar, the, the larger amounts of sugar are then fermenting and ultimately creating wine with um, a higher ABV or a higher alcohol level. Um, that may or may not be a bad thing, <laughs> um, but, but that is an issue for, for um, you know, especially the, the older wineries that are very specific in their, you know, like very expensive wines that they need to produce a specific way. Um, so that can cause problems. And of course, that, that it will essentially, you know, change the taste. Um, and you know it is harder to to uh, grow usable crops as the seasons are changing. The the climate is changing. Um, it's creating more arid land in some places, floods in other places, and so that's obviously going to affect production in the long run. So moving on, I'm almost finished. Um, what can you do? Um, as I mentioned, a quick Google search. It's very easy to research um, environmentally friendly wineries or breweries or distilleries. Um, like I said, they don't try to hide it, so you just have to kind of do a little bit of searching and you'll find them quite easily. Um, and learn how to make your own cocktails. First of all, way cheaper, um, but also you know what you're putting into them. So you know that I'm using this sustainable liquor. Um, I bought my um, strawberries at the farmer mar market, so you know that they're local. Um, buying at farmer's markets is a great way to know that you are absolutely shopping local as opposed to like a big chain store where stuff gets shipped in from all over the place. Um, and that's a, a really good way to cut down on your own carbon footprint. And moving on to now making the drinks. So with these drinks, um, I'm making one with gin and one with vodka. Um, as I mentioned, these are both um, environmentally friendly um, liquors that I, I looked, I searched out. Um, I was going to make a, a sheet for you explaining them, but I didn't have time. Um, but you can always come look at them and, and look them up yourselves if you feel so inclined. Um, both of these take simple syrup which is essentially kind of just sugar water. It's to kind of help make your, your drink taste a little bit nicer or sweeter. And you know, for anybody, like some people like very sweet drinks, some people don't, so you can put as much or as little as you want. Um, so one way to, again, cut down your, your own carbon footprint is to create your own simple syrup. It's really easy, um, and making your own uh, will cut down on your cost, but also, <coughs> Um, cut down on like you know all of the the problems that come with the manufacturing process all the environmental problems that is so transportation and production and, and all of that stuff energy use so if you're just making it yourself any simple simple syrup is sugar and water ha like one to one <coughs> and then and then flavors you can basically add whatever you want what we're going to be using today is lavender simple syrup and hibiscus simple syrup and basically the way you do that you put um, the sugar and water together with the lavender and it's just because the way the lavender blossoms like kind of work. You want to put all three together and then um, put it in a pan, bring it to a boil, let it boil for just a minute. You want to mix it until it's completely smooth. 
once it's boiled for a minute, then you let it um, rest for about 30 minutes, and then you strain the flowers out, and you have your lavender simple syrup. Um, with hibiscus, it's very similar, um, except you use dried hibiscus blossoms. And you just do the sugar and water first. And then once you take it off the heat, then uh, you add the hibiscus, let it sit, you know, mix it around, let it sit for about 15 minutes. And then you strain out the hibiscus, and you have your um, hibiscus uh, simple syrup. And, and it's done slightly differently just because of the, the way that the, um, the flowers kind of leach their, their scent and their flavor. Um, if you were to boil the hibiscus, it would just destroy the, the flowers <laughs> and, and make kind of a gross simple syrup. Um, so it's just some of that might just be kind of trial or error, but a lot of these different recipes are, you can find online very simply also. Now, to make the drinks. So, <laughs> so we've already mixed them for you here ahead of time. Hopefully the ice hasn't melted too much. But I'm going to show you um, these shakers. Very easy. Uh, they're like five bucks, ten bucks online, something like that, and they're really fun. You just need some ice, and so we're doing the spa day one first. So that's the one with the cucumbers. So we'll cut up some cucumbers to put in there. And in this case, I'm actually using a cucumber-infused vodka, um, but you don't have to do that. You could just use regular vodka. It works just as well, um, and it's just slightly less cucumbery. So we'll do that. We need two ounces of vodka. And you can adjust the quantity of alcohol. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you can add more. Yeah, I was going to say, if it was me, I would do more than two ounces, but, but that's me. Um, and then, let's see, this is lemon juice. So I have half a lemon here. So we'll just do half for now. And again, all of these, you know, I have the, the measurements on there because those are the measurements that I found work the best. But obviously, you know, it's a mixed drink. You can always adjust any of the, the ingredients that you want. Um, I know when, when I was uh, playing around with this, coming up with recipes for this talk, um, I was with two of my girlfriends. So um, I was just getting them drunk while I was making, playing bartender. And uh, one of them kept saying that the drinks were too sweet, and the other one kept saying that she liked them sweeter. And I apparently am right in between them, so I just went with what I liked. Um, so I'm not a big fan of super sweet drinks, but I do like them if they have a little bit of sweetness. So that's what, that's what I was going with. So, so we did that. So if that. you think you're coming down with a cold, you have to dip the equipment you have. Um, the lemon juice and the cucumber, just one more excuse. <laughs> I mean, I don't know why you need an excuse. <laughs> but <laughs> But yeah, sure. <laughs> so this is the lavender simple syrup. So unfortunately, I didn't have time to make my own, but I actually normally do. But I, so I bought this. You can buy this. I bought this. Yeah. Um, I, but I normally do like to make my own simple syrups. Um, but I didn't have time. So did that and put a little club soda in there. Can you tell me what brand is that? Yeah, it's a uh, Sonoma Syrup Company. So you can come up at the end and just look at their choices. Oh, sorry. So the vodka I'm using, it's Crop um, Harvest Earth. It's organic vodka. And this is specifically cucumber-infused vodka. And it's in a clear bottle. Um, it is in a clear bottle, unfortunately, yeah. It's, I mean, it's pretty difficult to, uh, to get anything without a clear bottle. Um, well, I mean, so this, or sorry, without a, without a colored bottle. Um, I mean, at least with wines, a white wine tend to come, they, those tend to come in uh, clear bottles, but red wines will never come in a clear bottle. And that has to do with, um, yeah, that's the problem, is too much light um, causes problems for the, uh, the wine. Um, That one. Um, so we have that in here. Can I use you that cup? You don't have to drink it. It does have alcohol. It is past 12, 
so it is acceptable to drink. So, and it's five o'clock somewhere. <laughs> and if anybody wants extra club soda or cucumber or alcohol in it, just let me know. Just come up here and I'll put it in there for you. So I'm not sure. They may not have enough club soda in it. Yeah. Okay. So let me rinse this out. Okay. Um, the uh, the club soda that I used is actually a slightly lemon flavored club soda. Um, because I use lime juice in the drink, having a lemon flavored club soda kind of uh, worked well. Um, with this other one, the uh, the strawberry aloha, uh, we're using hibiscus um, simple syrup, and the club soda that I'm using is actually slightly mango flavored. Um, so that way it's a little bit uh, nicer kind of tropical blend. So we get the strawberries. Some ice. But you can just use regular club soda without any, um, without any flavors. That works just as well, um, especially if you don't want too punchy of a flavor and you want it to be more subtle. All right, we got strawberries, that hibiscus. One thing that um, you'll notice if you do make your own simple syrup and you're using uh, flowers um, for the infusion, um, especially when it comes to hibiscus, depending on the color of hibiscus flowers you, that you use, it'll change the color of your syrup. So that will ultimately change the color of your drink. And uh, you can do a lot of really fun, sort of colorful, tropical kind of themes if you want to, if you're having a party or something. So in this one, we're using uh, Koval dry gin. It's uh, kosher and, um, and a green, green gin. Koval, K-O-V-A-L. It's a gin. Yeah. I just realized I forgot to add club soda to this, so we will add the club soda. I forgot. What is that? Room is for hire. I, I am a, a, a starving grad student, so I'm always looking for extra money. So we'll just add that. And there's that one. So yummy. Um, one thing I forgot to mention, um, if you guys want to sign up for um, my program, the Citizen Science program, and um, be part, get our email blast, um, my intern Pete back there has a sign-up sheet. You just give him your email address, and uh, I'll add you to our list. So you can find out about any events that we're having also. One other quick thing, you guys. Um, we want to make sure that we are trying to stay as sustainable as possible. So uh, we have three different trash bins up here. This first one is for food waste, only food waste. Um, no meat, but anything else is fine. Um, the second one, the blue one, is recycling. So that's any paper products, um, not napkins, nothing that's gotten wet or has like food like residue on it. 
but any paper or um, if you have like you know a can like this, um, bottles, those are fine that can go in recycling. And then the last one is for any other trash. So um, plastic cups, napkins, uh, things like that would go in the last one. So um, you know this is going to go to the composting site, and then of course that'll go to recycling. So that way we can at least limit the amount of trash that we send to the, the to the landfill. Oh yeah, you can simple syrup. You can make it with almost anything because it's it's simple syrup is just sugar water. So you can basically flavor it or infuse it with almost anything. Yeah. Yeah, it's, that's one of my favorites, because it's also a very subtle lavender flavor, so it's, it's nice. It's a very kind of fresh tasting. I hope you enjoy the program. We do want to do this kind of like on a monthly basis. We'll feature something different. We'll serve a nice uh, drink, and next time maybe we'll talk about a specific food. And then we'll, you'll get to sample it and, you know, maybe, like I said, plant the seed so that when you are doing your shopping, whether it's for yourself or...